Okay, I, I can tell that uh, not everybody got their nap this morning. All right, maybe the microphone's not on. We'll try that again. Good evening. Good evening. Woo, that's what it was. It was the microphone. I'm sure of it. We are glad to see you all. Thanks for being back with us tonight. I, one of the things I love to direct music on and sing about is heaven. And we're going to do some of that as we sing about the Lord's return to us. Would you do me a favor? Would you stand as we sing, Our Lord is returning. Oh, shout hallelujah. going to be, some of us are going to have to go, huh? Is that the best shout you got? Let's try that again. We need a little more. I know. Oh, I get it. We're in a Baptist church. We're not supposed to shout. All right. It's okay. I promise. You can put a smile on your face. You can laugh at church. It's all right. Do me a favor. Let's sing that again. And let's sing it like we mean it. Our Lord is returning. Our Lord is returning. And no, that doesn't mean go home. Pastor is convinced because of his dad. That's what it means. Jesus is coming again. Another great hymn as we talk about the Lord's soon return. Marvelous message. Marvelous message. We was up next. Let's have a word of prayer and we will have a seat. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this opportunity to meet together, to sing praises to you and to your son. We ask you also to bless us as we study your word. We pray to open our hearts and our minds and our souls and pour in the richness of your word. 
In Christ's name we pray, amen. Go ahead and have a seat. I'm looking around. I think I see people that have been here tonight. We do have some guests, but you've been here before. Is there anybody that hasn't been here before? You haven't heard our spiel and our offer of what good people we are to give to other charities? We are good people. We do give to charity. But right now we're going to sing. Choir singing glorious. We're a mission church. Oh, I, for, I forgot about Mike Malone. <laughs> if I let you come, would you introduce the choir next? Come on up then. As long as we make that deal, we're good. Thanks for reminding All me. All right. Thank you, preacher. <laughs> All right. Our missionary spotlight this evening is Chris and Lucinda Radenbaugh. Uh, this letter we have is, uh, was written j just this past month in December. Since our last letter, we have experienced several discouraging events. Inter uh, interspersed between these have been rays of God's glorious light. One of our college graduates doing ministry in Zimbabwe with his family contacted us and said they felt God wanted them to move to Cape Town. We were uh, so pleased to hear this, they took over the work and Lighthouse Death Baptist Church was born. Nearly every week we received pictures of souls saved and baptisms. However, due to serious marriage issues this year, we had to call the couple back, uh, back to uh, our church for counseling and they also had some other difficulties there. He ends and says, join us in prayer that God will provide a new pastor for this church. In our church in Johannesburg, uh, we had to pull one of our men out of ministry when we discovered sin in his life. So a couple difficult things there, two of the churches that they're working with. We've given him some time uh, to restore himself to the Lord before using him. Uh, in the ministry again. This year, we also have seen a dramatic increase in witch doctors using our property for their uh, incantations and rituals. So a lot of difficulties going there. The police told them that they need to uh, have a fence around their property. They're asking for us and other churches of like, of, of like faith and those who are supporting churches uh, to pray that God would provide the finances to put the fence up. They're still waiting for a quote for the fencing and installation. They want to do it as soon as possible to keep the witch doctors away. So that's some difficult news that they mentioned. But we have some good news here. With these things going on, we continue to serve the Lord, preach the gospel, and trust him. God has been faithful in blessing us and we praise the Lord. We were in one of the hardware shops that we frequent. And after placing our order with the man helping us, we gave him a track and asked him to read it. He said he would later on a, on a return visit. We asked him if he did read the track. He, he did affirm that he read it. He asked, well, what do you think about that after you read it? And the his name was Walter, and uh, he said, I asked Jesus to save me. So he, he goes on to say, we praise the Lord, and we brought him a Bible and invited him to church. Now other staff have asked for Bibles, so we pray uh, more souls will come to Christ. We praise the Lord for providing for our death camp. Next year, a dear friend contacted us and asked if, there's, if they had any special needs. We asked our friend if they could help in providing a camp for 50 young people to come to camp. And that camp is going to take place March of this year. Praise the Lord, he agreed and provided enough funds so that 25 can come free of, free of charge. And he paid for uh, 25 of them to uh, pay half price. Camp cost about $53, so they still need some more funds raised for that, and they're also asking us to pray about that. What an honor to give our lives to the risen Savior and have the trophies of our service in this life. The men and women 
we've led to Christ. Your servants, for Christ's sake, Chris and Lucinda. So let's pray for Chris and Lucinda and the work that they're serving the Lord. Father, we do thank you for the Lucinda, for uh, for uh, Chris and and uh, and Lucinda as they serve you uh, to the death of South Africa. We pray that your hand would continue to be upon them. We pray for these two needs of now these churches that they're ministering to that do not have pastors. We ask that you would restore and raise up those to fill out those uh, those positions. And then also we pray that you'd raise the funds up needed for both the fence and then also for the, the, for the others to be able to go to camp. We pray that your hand would continue to be upon these missionaries. We thank you that you allow us to partner with them. We ask all these things in the name of our Savior. Amen. The choir is now going to sing Glorious Day.
and that it is. It will be a glorious day. You got a beautiful smile on your face. Do me a favor. Share that with somebody near you. Stand and shake some hands and let folks know you're glad to see them this evening. is coming soon. Join me on this awesome hymn. Jesus is coming to earth again.
see it at the very end? <laughs> if I believed in reincarnation, I don't think he was an animal in a past life. <laughs> but I don't believe in reincarnation, so he just has happy feet. It's just heavenly, pardon me? Count, yeah, <laughs> one, two, three. <laughs> heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to give. We know you bless us. We look forward to that blessing. In Christ's name, amen. She raced the old ladder with all of her might and shouted, Dad, have no as I stretched tied to store the stockings and trim in the attic for another year. We were busily packing our Christmas away while singing a carol in When I heard a young voice in innocence inquire, do we store away Jesus too?
Well, we're studying the life of Jacob. Tonight we begin Genesis chapter 32 in that study. There are parts of the Christian life that are difficult. One of the most frequent difficulties that we face is how to behave around those who've offended us and or those whom we have offended. Granting forgiveness is difficult, so is asking for it and receiving it. Our next two studies tonight and next Sunday morning are going to show us an example of how to deal with those difficult duties of forgiving and being forgiven. When Jacob and Esau, his twin brother, were last together, two decades earlier, they were at war. Jacob, with the help of his mother, had stolen the patriarchal blessing from Esau by deceiving their father. Chapter 27. Esau responded with a threat, verse 41 of chapter 27. The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then I will slay my brother Jacob. In fear, Jacob left for Uncle Laban's house in Haran, some 500 miles away. 20 years later, Jacob is now returning home. And the closer he came to Canaan, the more concerned he became about meeting Esau. He even sent a search party out to look for his brother. When the search party returned, the news they brought was devastating, for the circumstances indicated that Esau had neither forgotten nor forgiven his brother. But before Jacob met Esau, which took place in chapter 33, he had another encounter with an even more powerful opponent. It's not a chance meeting, but a part of the plan of God to prepare Jacob for meeting his brother. So Genesis chapter 32 is about the preparation for the meeting with Esau. Genesis 33 deals with the particulars of their meeting. Now, if you feel like your life is nothing more than a series of meetings, you might be able to pity Jacob because he has just left a meeting with Laban, which had followed a meeting with his wives. He's dreading a meeting with Esau. He's having an unscheduled meeting with the angel of the Lord, and he also is going to meet a host of angels of the Lord. It's just meeting after meeting after meeting. So let's read Genesis chapter 32, beginning in verse 1. We'll read down through verse 12. And Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's host. He called the place, the name of that place, Mahanium. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, into the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Thus shall you speak unto my lord Esau. Thy servant Jacob saith thus, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed there until now. I have oxen and asses, flocks and men servants and women servants. And I have sent to tell my lord that I may find grace in thy sight. And the messengers returned unto Jacob, saying, We came to thy brother Esau, and also he cometh to meet thee, and four hundred men are with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. And he divided the people that was with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two bands and said, If Esau come to the one company and smite it, then the other company which is left shall escape. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which said unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will Deal with thee, thee with thee, deal well with thee. I am not worthy of the least of all thy mercies, and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me, and the mother. With the children. And thou said, I will surely do thee good and make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. Heavenly Father, help us. We pray you'd teach us things we need to know. We pray you'd encourage our faith in a dark time. We have examples here. Turns out they're good examples to follow. Who would have thought it? 
the last time these two men were together. We thank you for the change in Jacob's life. And we're grateful even that Esau had saw fit to forgive. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, once the problems with Laban were solved, in verse 1, Jacob went on his way to Canaan. As he neared his homeland, in verse 1, he's allowed to see the angels of God, or as Jacob called them, God's host. What began as a blessing for Jacob, chapter 32, is going to end as a burden, a burden which he is going to bear for the rest of his life. He's going to be given a limp from a bad hip, given to him by the Lord himself. Now in verse 1, Jake went on his way. Angels of God met him. God had promised to be with Jacob. God knew when and God knew how to provide the help that the man needed. Jacob is about to meet his brother. The weight of the pressure of that meeting was heavy on his spirit. And at this time of stress, God gave to Jacob a divine revelation designed to encourage and strengthen his faith. David wrote in Psalm chapter 46 and verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. That divine principle was, due, was true for Jacob as it was for David, and it is for two, us, as, us as well. Sometimes the Lord strengthens us just before a trial arrives, but he may wait until the moment of the trial to dispense his grace to us. One of the sure signs that we have been the recipient of divine help is the peace that the Lord provides during and following a time of stress. For example, just before Abraham met with the king of Sodom, God sent the king of Salem to strengthen and encourage him. God sent wise men from the east to Joseph and Mary with expensive gifts just before angels sent them to Egypt to escape Herod's rage. The gold, frankincense, and myrrh no doubt allowed them to travel to and live in that foreign country. God prepares us for hardships that we are going to face. The former and present blessings are given to us for our present and future trials and to relieve our burdens. God knows when we need help. God knows the help that we need. And God knows when the best time to give it is. And so in verse 1 and 2, the angels met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's host. God gave Jacob something that he could see. A visible manifestation of a great army of angel warriors whose task was to watch over Jacob. Jacob's fear right now is that Esau is coming. He hasn't heard about the 400 men yet. God gave him the sight of the angels to protect him before he gave him the word that there are 400 men there. God is ahead of the problem. He's taking care of this man. Jacob has guardian angels. Elisha was given a similar vision when the Syrian army surrounded him in Dothan, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15, 16, and 17. It's not the norm. Human eyes usually cannot see in the spiritual realm. But when God wishes to show us such things, he can open our, our eyes, our minds, our understanding, and let us see what we normally could not see. Now, it, you could call it insight. You, you might even call it intuition. But if God chooses, it could be a revelation. You might be able to see something that you never see again. Jacob's about to be so frightened about some news about his brother. He would need the assurance that this vision was already providing. God would protect him. An army of heavenly warriors had been assigned to take care of that task for him. The encouragement came in the right time and in the right way. God knows our needs. And he meets them appropriately. In verse 2, there's a memorial called the name of that place. Mahanium, what Jacob saw so impressed him that he felt it appropriate to memorialize the occasion and the place. The name Mahanium means double host or two hosts or two camps. There was the visible camp of Jacob's family and servants and then the invisible camp, which God allowed him to see, of angels. By the way, later in the history of Israel, there was a city founded at that place and given the very same name. The name reminds us who live in the New Testament of the truth that we are not alone. Jesus has said, I will never leave you 
nor forsake you. No matter what you go through, you're not alone. It might be good for us to take special notice of the times in our lives when the presence of God was needed and realized. Memorials of the mind can be even more valuable than memorials that the world uses to mark special occasions because spiritual blessings are more valuable than earthly ones. Speaking of memorials, our nation right now is embarking on destroying memorials that honored people who lived 150 years ago. I think you should take notice of who is doing it, and if you think it's wrong, just mark it down. Those people never get your vote again. Why would you vote for people who do that which you think is wrong? I think that a lot of Christians in America right now are walking along blind. We are voting at a tradition. We've been this, this way for years and years, and the party has changed, and we haven't changed with it. But we still vote for them. And we're voting for the destruction of our country. Shame on us. I wonder if one day the Lord will not hold us accountable for how we vote. If every idle word is going to be brought to account, how about, is the Lord going to hold us accountable for how we voted and who we voted? And personally, I hope he does. Because I think it's deserved. We are taking the greatest country that God ever made, bar Israel. I believe the United States of America is the greatest country that God, and we are watching it be destroyed, and we are helping by how we vote. Well, in verse 3 through 7, there's a warning about the meeting. Shortly after the encouragement comes some bad news. The meeting with Esau might be rough. The number of men with him is large. And Jacob is surrounded by women and children and servants who were farmhands, not soldiers. God prepared him first for the bad news by giving him good news. Ever have someone do that to you? Well, you want the good news first or the bad news first? I don't want bad news ever. And I don't want to make the choice. You make the choice. You know what is there. Whatever is the softest way to give me the, the bad news, that's the way I want it. Give me good news and bad news or bad news and good news. But I don't want to make that choice. Fine, here that God gave good news first. Then bad news. That might be something to consider. Let me encourage you. And then we'll, we'll talk about the challenges that are coming. So in verse 3 through 5, we see the message. Jacob sent men to find Esau and notify Esau of Jacob's return and his desire to live peacefully in Canaan. And the details of the message concern where he had been and what he had obtained while he was away. I have sojourned with Laban, stayed there until now. Laban was not just Jacob's uncle, he's also Esau's uncle. So he doesn't need to introduce him, he just names him. Esau knows exactly who he is. No one in Canaan knew where Jacob had been the past 20 years other than his mother, and it appears his mother told no one, and she has now passed away, and he's coming home. Matter of fact, the folks in Canaan didn't even know what Jacob was dead or alive. Fear sent him away. He had not planned to stay away for two decades. The reason he had stayed in the next verse, verse 5, wealth. I have oxen and asses and flocks and men servants and maid servants. He left Canaan with nothing. Matter of fact, he said, I crossed the Jordan River with a staff, one thing in his hand and his clothes, and that's all that he had when he arrived in Haran. And he's coming back a very wealthy man. He's not returning looking like a beggar who wants a handout. There are no ulterior motives in his return. Everything that was done in the meeting and before the meeting was to show Esau that Jacob is a changed man. He's changed by what he owns. He's changed by how he talks. You, 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 tell, you tell Esau, you call him Lord Esau. The design went beyond proclaiming that Jacob was different. 
This pre-meeting message proclaimed that his intentions were good. Look at verse 4. We'll call it the abasing of Jacob, done by himself. Thus shall ye speak unto my lord Esau. Thy servant Jacob says this. He placed himself beneath Esau. He was practicing what became biblical principle in Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 4. If the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee, leave not thy place, for yielding pacifieth great offenses. What Jacob did went beyond cultural courtesy. It was an act of conciliation. Jacob made certain that his servants gave Esau great respect. Notice also the appeal for grace, verse 5. And I have sent to tell my Lord that I might find grace in thy sight. Jacob knew he deserved to be mistreated. He had mistreated Esau badly twice. If he got what he deserved, he would be in trouble. He's asking for mercy. He's asking for grace. Did not take long for the plea for a pardon for the past offenses to come. Jacob made certain that the plea for the pardon arrived before he arrived. Esau knows why he's coming. He needs forgiveness. Jacob is not asking for his rights. He's not demanding that birthright, the the right of the eldest son, which he had paid for back in chapter 25 of Genesis. He's not asking that to be restored to him. When we concentrate on having our rights, we tend to ignore our our responsibilities. If you want your right, you need to put your responsibilities first. When we concentrate on our responsibilities, our rights seem less important to us than our responsibilities. I was a really young kid when John F. Kennedy said the word, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. I may have got it backwards because I don't, but I, I got both sides right. It's been a long time since I remember someone saying, let's, let's, let's serve our country again. But we all want our country to serve us. By the way, I like my rights. I think the First Amendment is marvelous. I think the Second Amendment protects the First Amendment. I don't want either one of them going away. I think the Fourth Amendment is great. I think the Tenth Amendment has been ignored. I think the Fourteenth Amendment has been abused by the very people who have sworn to uphold all of these things. So why are we voting for them? They violate your Constitution, and you honor them by putting them back into office. I need duct tape at times. Every time we have an election in this country, I need duct tape to hold my head together because my head is going to burst at how people vote. I can't imagine. I I think to myself, what's wrong with you people? So he speaks about his whereabouts, his wealth. He abases himself. He appeals for grace. And then he gives a warning. Or a warning is proclaimed in anyway, verse 6 and 7. The messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to thy brother Esau. He also cometh to meet thee. How did he know he was coming? Jacob's got a large group. He's got 12 kids. He's got two wives and their two servants. He's got manservants and maidservants. He's traveling really slow. There are people passing him by, and there's news of a really big group coming this way, and Esau somehow figures it out. Why would Esau think that Jacob, who went away with nothing, is coming back with it a lot? Because he knows the guy. If anybody can go away and 20 years later come back rich, it's Jacob, and Esau knows it. And so he figures it out, and he goes out to meet him. With 400 men with him, verse 7, then Jacob's greatly afraid and distressed. Not just afraid, he's distressed. And he divided the people that was with him, flocks and herds, camels, into two bands. Because of the size of his caravan, he's moving real slowly. Other travelers have passed him by. Esau knows he's coming, and Esau comes with an army of 400 men. It does not offer an indication that he's welcoming his arrival. 
not like the prodigal's father coming to meet his long lost son. It looks like Esau and his 400 men are on the way to meet Jacob and his caravan. And Jacob knows he is about to be overwhelmed. And so he decides there is going to be a slaughter. And since there's going to be a slaughter, I will save half of my family. Can you imagine? How do you make that decision? Well, he doesn't know which side is going to be attacked. So he's got to divide him. He may have put half the wives here, half the children there, half of the... Uh, can you imagine the grief this man is going through and the absolute fear of losing half his family, half his stock, half his servants? Verse 7, there's a reply. From this point on, Everything that Jacob did, he did out of fear. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. And distressed. So he partitions the camp, does it pretty quick in verse 7. His purpose is pretty obvious. One's going to get destroyed. The other will escape. What do you do next? I know what I'd do next. When there's nothing you can do, what you should do is pray. You get bad news from a doctor. Okay? There's nothing you can do. What should you do? Pray. Because things are not hopeless with God. And so he does what he can, and then he goes to the Lord. Verse 9. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, the Lord which said unto me. He did not seek help from any of the idols that any of the people around him were worshiping. He did not ask Rachel to borrow the idols she stole from her father. Jacob believed God, so when he needed help, he sought out God. And God influenced his lives and human affairs, and God promises, God made promises to his father. To his grandfather, God made promises to him, and he reminded God. You made promises to my father, grandfather Abraham. You made promises to my father Isaac, and you made promises to me. Is that a proper way to pray? I've never seen the scripture correct anybody for praying that way. I mean, when you pray... If you want to quote what the Bible says about what God has said, I think you're on really good ground. Pray God's word back to him. Pray his promises back to him. God has not forgotten them, but you need to remember them. Jacob's prayer was a product of his faith. He was not going to be disappointed because God is our refuge and strength, a very help in the time of trouble. David concluded that same chapter of Psalms by extolling the virtue of seeking the Lord's help in times of trouble. He said, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Chapter 46 of Psalms, verse 11. Now, Jacob has recognized that God's host was with him. Verse 2, it would be a wise thing for him to seek help from the captain of the host. And he does. There's a guarantee cited in the prayer, verse 9, verse 12, second part of verse 9. The Lord said unto me, return to thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal with thee, deal well with thee. Jacob said, Lord, I am here right now because you told me to come here. In other words, you put me here. Take care of me. Verse 12, and thou said... I will surely do thee good and make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. You gave me promises. I expect the promises to be kept. I one time said, offended some people when I said it, but I don't think it was wrong, that if I do not go to heaven when I die, I'm going to stick my bony finger in the face of God and call him a liar. 
Because the word of God said, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Because the word of God says, for God to love the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, meaning me, believes on him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. I have the promise of God that I'm going to heaven. And if I don't go, God lied. Well, God doesn't lie. I don't plan on calling God a liar. I plan on going to heaven. I have, I have no doubt about it. I can even be smart aleck about it at times. Like, you can't scare me with heaven. I've had guns stuck in my face. 38 special. I had a double barrel shotgun stuck in my chest years ago. I've been through a pandemic. I had people ask me during the pandemic, and they say, you're not afraid, are you? No. I'm not afraid. My faith in God is so strong that if he allows, asks me to leave this place early, I get to heaven earlier. That's how strong my faith is. I am not worried at all. My doctor recently gave me some medicine for cholesterol. I've already tried this stuff. I said to her, I'm not taking it. She said, well, <laughs> and I said, listen, doc, I would rather die 10 years earlier than have this medicine give me brain fog for 10 years and have Alzheimer's. I I I'll take 10 years less of life for 10 years in a room stuck. I don't want to go to heaven now, but I don't want to go to heaven after 10 years of being, dare I say that, I don't want to be Joe Biden. I actually feel very sorry for our president. We put a man in the office that ought to be in a nursing facility. Shame on us. This is the most cruel thing imaginable. When my father-in-law moved here a few years ago, he... He was in the same shape that Joe Biden was when he entered the office. My father-in-law could no longer be a missionary. He could no longer pastor a church. He was not mentally capable of doing any of it. And it would have been cruel for us to act like he could. I think the people around Joe Biden are dishonorable people. I don't know where they came from. I think it's shameful what's going on. Well, Jacob prayed. He pleaded his cause by repeating the promises. He also offered grace in the prayer. Verse 10, I am not worthy of the least of all thy mercies. This is not speaking to Esau. This is Jacob speaking to God. And of all truth which thou hast showed to thy servant. He is now a very wealthy, well-respected man, and he gives honor to the Lord for everything the Lord had done, and he gives honor to the Lord for everything he has. He was wealthy because of God's mercy. And you and I are no different. You go get in your car tonight, you have it because of God's mercy. When you walk into your home, you have it because of God's mercy. Everything you have is a result of God's mercy because all it would take is some horrible event in your life and you could be in a hospital or you could be in a nursing home for the rest of your life and have nothing. It could happen in an automobile accident. It could happen in a heart attack or a stroke or an aneurysm and everything could be different. Everything you have, everything you enjoy is of God's mercy. Might do us good Look through our pictures and thank God for our family. Our son-in-laws and daughter-in-laws, our grandchildren. Every good and perfect gift we have is from above. Isn't God good? You start your car. Yesterday, our car broke down. Our good car broke down. We're coming back from making a visit. All of a sudden, the heater thing is on cold. I know it's not that cold. I didn't realize it. It was raining outside. My wife got in the car last night, and she said, the air conditioner's not working. 
What are you going to do about it? Well, we'll take the car by on Monday. I can't drive that car. It's not going to hurt you to not have an air conditioner. They used to all not have air conditioners. You know what? If that car cost me $1,000 to fix, praise God, I've got that car. My wife looked at that car and she says, isn't it beautiful? It is. God is good. You know, you're saved because God is gracious. Why, why were you born in the United States of America? And why were you born of Christian parents, if you were? If, if you were born in this country, if you were born and your parents knew the Lord, you have won life's lottery. Because God is gracious and God is merciful. 20 years earlier, verse 10, Jacob says, With my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I'm become two bands. I've got so much stuff I can divide my things in half, and he's still rich on either side. Jacob had nothing but the clothes he wore and what he can carry. Now he has two wives. Each of those wives have a servant, which is also a wife to him. Twelve children. He has manservants and maidservants, and he has livestock, flocks, sheep, oxen, cattle, birds, pack animals to carry his possessions, camels for his family to ride. So wealthy was he that when Esau, divided, Esau came to meet him, he divided his families into groups and then offered a huge present to Esau after dividing it. Verse 14, this is the gift to Esau, 200 she-goats, 20 he-goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, 30 milk camels with their coats, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 she-asses, and 10 foals. That's after he divided things out. This is the gift to his brother. It's almost like saying, I stole from you. Here's payment. The physical blessings of God were wonderful. But Jacob realized that there are more important things than physical blessings. For in his prayer, he acknowledges that he has returned to Canaan with living blessings. Two bands of people. And a band of angels to protect him. A couple times during our life, when our kids were learning to drive, they had the inevitable crash. We get a call. I believe your daughter was just involved in a wreck up here on Highway 41. First thought is, how bad? The person who had gone to the church years ago, earlier, and we knew them, said, she's okay. The car, not so much. Well, who cares about a car compared to a child? I have four children. I don't know how many cars I've owned during my life. Who cares about a car? By the way, you ought to care a lot more about people than possessions. One last thing, verse 11. He requests guarding in the prayer. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. It took Jacob a while to get to the point of his prayer. It is real easy when we pray to just jump in the most important part. But Jacob's kind of having a conversation with, with the Lord. He's not just saying, gimme, gimme, gimme. He's reminding God of God's promises. 
And he's offering humility. And now he asks for the most important thing. God, I need your help. Jacob took his fear to the Lord. It was not a matter of weakness. It was a demonstration of wisdom. I'll give you three things here, purposes for prayer. Number one, prayer allows you to recognize God's power and authority and work in your life. And when you pray, you should be looking at those things. Second of all, when you pray, you should thank God for his gifts and for his work on your behalf. And third of all, recognize his promise and his faithfulness. And don't forget that one of the purposes of prayer is to ask God for that which you cannot provide for yourself. You work for your money. You work for your possessions. Jacob didn't ask God for that. He just worked for it. He asked God for that which he could not provide for himself. That's a prayer that God will honor. If you ask God for money, big deal. When I was in Bible college, we had a fellow that in our dormitory didn't work. He just he would pray, usually a public prayer, and ask God for things in public prayer. And you know, the other kids in the Bible college felt guilty and would give him stuff. I never gave him a dime. Came out one time that I was a bad guy. I said, you know what? I asked God for a job. God gave me a job. What that guy's doing is just, he's abusing everybody here. He will not work. He's lazy. I said, I'll tell you what. When he starts praying in private in his closet and God answers the prayer, I'll have more faith in him. But right now, all I think he's doing is making people feel sorry for him. And I, I do feel sorry for him because he's a sorry individual for behaving that way. I am the most unspiritual man that ever graduated from that college. What I needed when I went there was a job. I asked God for a job. He gave me a job. So I went to work. Why would I ask God for money when if he gives me a job, I'll be able to take care of myself? Especially when the word of God tells me that I am just supposed to take care of myself and my family. Ask God for that which you cannot provide on your own. There's a lot of things there. How about, Lord, we're about to take a long trip. We ask for your protection. Lord, I'm sending my young people off to college. I ask for your protection. Lord, I've lost my job, and I need another job. I ask for your protection. Give me another job. Lord, my family member has just been diagnosed with cancer. And I need help. Ask God for things you can't provide. You honor him by doing that. If you ask him for something small, it's no big deal. But if you can't do it, you ask God for it, and God gives it. You will then praise God for it, and God gets honor for answering your prayer. Now, Heavenly Father, there is a lot to learn from Jacob. During those 20 years in Haran, he has become a deep, a man of deep faith, a man of trust in God, a man who knows you well. He returned home from Canaan a different man than he left, and the reason why is he met you on the way to Haran. Lord, I pray you'd remind us that none of us should be the same person we were 20 years ago. Certainly, we should not be the same person if we did not know you 20 years ago. We understand quite well that everyone in Christ is a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things become new. 
I pray you'd help us to understand it and help our friends and neighbors and family to recognize it. We're not the same. In Christ's name, amen. Stand with us, if you will. Jim's going to sing a verse. We'll join him on the second. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. He cares for Brother Jim, would you bring that microphone down and hand it to Joe Mobley? That was my phone that was going off earlier. I thought I had it on silent. It was a former member who's on the way to Africa and asked if I would like to give her money. I don't know if I want to or not, but Joe, please dismiss us. Bow our heads. Uh, Father God, we thank you for this past year. We ask you to guide us in this new year. We thank you for the study of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the things that they've encountered in their lives that we can use as a guide in our lives. But we thank you for that study. We thank you for the studies we have in our Sunday school classes as well. We thank you for this church. We're grateful for the new believers who are joining. And we thank you for that, Lord. And we ask all of this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.